All right, thank, thank, thank you all for being here and for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to you about sea turtles. So we're going to nerd out on sea turtles for a half hour or so, and specifically on hawksbill turtles, which is one species of sea turtle. A little bit about uh, where I'm coming from, just because I'm going to be referencing some different things in the talk, uh, is that the lasso, for about 10 years, I worked in the, along the Pacific coast of Latin America. Uh, with my wife Ingrid and my son Joaquin, my wife's also a sea turtle biologist, um, and we did a lot of hawksbill focused work out there. And then I came out here about ten months ago, so I haven't been here that long. But part of the reason why, is, so I do, I'm, I'm part of the Marine Turtle Biology and Assessment Program with the, the NOAA program, uh, National Marine Fisher, Fisheries Service. And um, one of the reasons that I, the draw for me to come out here, and one of the reasons why they wanted me to come out here, was to focus on hawksbill turtles, because we know very little about the species here around Hawaii. But they, obviously, there's lots of other sea turtles to learn about, and, and all that team and all that. So, um, but I just want to reference that I will be talking about some of the work in the Eastern Pacific, because there are some correlates and some overlap between what we think is happening with hawksbills here in Hawaii and what's happening in the Eastern Pacific. So, before I go on, I just want to acknowledge that. I'm like I said, I've only been here 10 years and there's a lot of people that have been here before me doing a lot of good work on 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 hawksbill turtles. And this is just a few of them. I'm probably missing some, but, you know, that, that happens. So uh, uh, I did. I did want to recognize them and a lot of good organizations that are involved. And and I definitely don't want to be taking the credit. So as I get into hawksbills in particular. I don't know how much you guys know about sea turtles and marine turtles. So I, I just want to talk, say say some general facts about them. And one is that they're air breathing reptiles, right? They have to surface to breathe. Uh, they're not fish, they're not marine mammals, or they're, they're reptiles. Um, and they, they, have, they all have a carapace and there's a total of seven species and six of them have a hard shell. So the carapace is the shell. Uh, and then there's one that has a soft, a leathery shell. It's called the leather bag. Now they spend more than 99% of their lives at sea. So the only time they emerge from the water is when they're hatching out of eggs and if they come to return to nest the female and then here in hawaii and some in galapagos we also have basking turtles which is a behavior you to unique to to hawaii and galapagos and they have poor vision out of the water and they have poor hearing usually very low decibels only and so the general sea turtle life cycle so what do sea turtles do and again this is general so it doesn't apply to all populations and all species necessarily but kind of the going paradigm what people think is that um let me see if this pointer works. So a sea turtle will come up, it'll lay a nest in the sand. And then after about 45 to, uh, it's going to do that occasionally, bear with me. Um, so after about 45 to 60 days, that the hatchings will emerge and then they'll go out into the pelagic habitat. So offshore habitat. And these are what's known as the lost years because when a turtle goes out, it's only, you know, 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters long. And, um, and there's no way to know where they go. And we know for some populations, say a loggerheads in the Atlantic, that they actually go out in the open ocean gyres and they will go in these massive trans oceanic uh, uh, drifting in, in the sargassum floats or the seaweed floats. And then after a period of anywhere from two to 10 years, depending on the species and the population, then they'll, uh, they'll recruit the neuritic foraging ground. So uh, close to shore. That's not all cases. Some do, they remain out in the pelagic habitats like logic, but generally that's the, the going paradigm. So those lost years though, I'll be kind of going back to that throughout this talk. It's still a phase that we don't really know. And it varies by, like I said, by population. So it's this big mystery because you, how do you put a tag on a turtle that's that big, right? How do you track it and know where it goes? It's really hard. But once they do recruit to these foraging grounds, they, they're, they're, they're highly fidelic to these areas. So they they return to these areas or they remain in these areas. But then once they reach sexual maturity, then they return back to their nesting beaches. Typically, the uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be the exact same nesting beach. It can be, but within the same vicinity. And then they'll do these migrations, these cyclical migrations between the foraging grounds and their nesting grounds, typically every two to three years. And they have a very vulnerable life history. So they're, they're a long lived species. So. It's funny because people ask you, oh, you know, how long do sea turtles live? And, you know, we're sea turtle scientists. We're supposed to know answers to this. But the fact is that oftentimes we don't because how do you how do you know uh, you get tag returns? But 80, 80, 100 years that can outlive some of us. Right. So it's hard to know. And that in captivity, things are different. So it, it can it can vary. But they're a long lot of species. So they have to survive throughout that time. And that, that's a difficult thing. And they also have delayed sexual maturity. So they're not reproductively active until it's 
20, sometimes as many as 40 years. This is again, dependent on resources, how much food do they have access to, the species, a lot of different things uh, are involved. But so you have to survive to at least 20 years to even begin reproducing. That is that makes them vulnerable as well. They have high hatchling mortality. So typically the number, although this can vary, is that one out of a thousand hatchlings that is released actually makes it to adulthood. So very low survive, survival rates. And they often undergo these really long migrations between their foraging and nesting habitats. And that opens them up to a lot of threats. So an amalgam of threats like that I'll talk about here in a second. But those migrations and having to live a long time and all that just makes it really difficult. And here you can see the different sizes for this is for green turtle, but just to give you an idea of how they can grow over time. So like I said, there are seven extant sea turtle species in the world, and there are five that inhabit the, the Pacific Ocean. And I'm going to be talking to you about the hawksbill turtle, and this is uh, a species that's considered uh, endangered by the Endangered Species Act, and not all species are. Some of them are, vul are vulnerable or have a different listing. And um, as far as the IUCN, which is kind of a, a global categorization uh, organizations so they rank species uh, they're critically endangered so they're only one of two species that on a global scale is con considered critically endangered and um, they're coral reef engineers so this isn't a really great photo but um, what you, hawksbills really like coral reef habitats that's the majority in the eastern pacific that's not always true they inhabit mangrove estuaries but in most of the world they're known and they're associated with coral reefs and in these habitats they they provide biological control of sponges so they eat certain sponge species and in doing so they they provide biological control so those sponges don't overgrow the reef and then that frees up space and nutrients for other organisms to, to feed and grow. Some of the sponge species that they feed on are very aggressive and will just grow over the whole reef. So they're very important. They have an important ecological role, at least the one that we're familiar with on, on coral reefs. Some of their unique characteristics that distinguish them from other sea turtle species is they have a really narrow head and they have a really pointy beak, hence the name hawksbill. And this is because they're often sticking their head into crevices uh, to get at their prefer, per, preferred food items like sponges and tunicates and things of that nature. They also have a serrated shell, so they have a saw shaped shell, and you can see it there along the edge. Um, and that is, oh, I forgot I need to do it here with the, with the clicker. So that this serrated edge, you can see it on the shell here. And as they get older, so here's an older one, you can see that the edge is much less serrated. So as they get older, it tends to get more rounded. And then they also have these overlapping scoots. So these scoots are these basically these big scales here. And they're the only species of sea turtle that has that. All the other, so these are basically like roof shingles, right? They go one on top of the other, whereas other species have them where they're fused together like tiles, essentially. Um, and like a lot of sea turtles, they, they face an amalgam of threats and that includes egg and meat consumption all over the world, uh, in, in Latin America and Asia, it, here historically in Hawaii, they were, they were eaten. And so that's something that confronts all sea turtles as a threat. They are also by caught in both artisanal and commercial fisheries operations. So trawls and gill nets and all, all these things cause a big problem. Habitat degradation from uh, uh, development, from uh, sewage out effluent, all kinds of things also really impact their nesting beaches and their foraging grounds. And unique to hawksbill turtles is the tortoise shell trade. So historically, they were hunted for their shells. So if you've ever heard of tortoise shell sunglasses or their trinkets that are made, uh, that they all come from hawksbill turtles, not from any other of the other sea turtles. So they have this added threat that the other sea turtles don't have. So even if typically you get a small turtle, oftentimes they're kept because they can either be sold or because their shells are really beautiful and people will hang a whole dead stuffed turtle on their wall. Um, so hawksbills in Hawaii. So here they're called Honuea. Um, they, they in they were discovered, so they were first documented here in Hawaiian Islands in 1972, but their first like established nesting beaches were identified in the late 80s. And subsequent to that, monitoring programs were set up. So first here in the, you can see in the, in the southern coast of the big island here, this is where the majority of nesting occurs. So about 90% of all the known hawksbill nesting in Hawaii occurs right along this coast. And that is a project that is run by this uh, Hawaii Island Hawksbill Turtle Recovery Project. And then along southern Maui, down here, is where Hawaii Wildlife Fund 
monitors sea turtles as uh, hawksbill turtles as well. That's typically about one or two individuals per year, so much fewer. But as you'll see, is what this chart is showing you here. So these gray bar graphs are the average are the number of nesting females recorded each year since 1989. Bear in mind that this first uh, four years or so, there wasn't a lot of monitoring effort, so that's why there's this dashed line here. But you can see that here on the on the, the axis here on the left, you can see that we're talking about 15 individual turtles. Average is 14, but you can see that right in here is our, your average. You can see some years it's more and some years it's less. And then on your other axis over here, you have the number of nests. So just where that's what the black line is, the number of nests, and the gray bars are the number of females. So an extremely small population, 14 nesting females per year. Oh, and then I wanted to comment too, is that you don't see any really increase here. So if you ignore these first few years, basically it's just a flat line. If I put a trend, a trend line in there, you'd see that it's just flat. So the population has not increased in the last 28 years or so. And I want to talk about green turtles and really the, the, the dichotomy in what's happening with these two species. So this is the species that most of you see in the waters here around Hawaii. It's very abundant. There are about 400 nests per season deposited in, in the state of Hawaii by green turtles. And again, only about 50 for, for hawksbill turtles. And you know, there's ways to distinguish between them. because So this is a green turtle in the back and this is a hawksbill in the front. It's hard to tell if you're not a sea turtle expert, but there are some distinguishing characteristics like the rounded head here on the green turtle versus the more pointy beak on the hawksbill. And then there's the ways if you get up close that you can really tell like the number of prefrontal scales and the serrated edge that I was talking about for the hawksbill that is not on the green turtle. But it's tricky. Um, but what I want to get back to is that green turtle nesting, since protection was implemented in the, in the early 70s, the population has increased at about 5% Per year and so we're seeing hawk, uh, green turtle populations rebound big time all around Hawaii and fishermen and tourists and everyone will tell you that have spent time here over over the last couple decades is that there are way more honu now than there were before meanwhile the red line down here is the hawksville population it just kind of re remained relatively stagnant there's some seats over here if you want to come in uh, it re remained relatively st stagnant and hasn't really increased. And so why we're seeing this increase in the, in the green turtle population, but not in the hawksbill population, still remain is somewhat of a mystery. Some potential reasons this could be is uh, resource access. So as many of you know, is that coral reefs have been degraded all around the world in the last several decades. So here, this isn't Hawaii, but it's just to show you some of these regime shifts. So you hear in Jamaica, you have a really healthy reef on the top and then that same reef down in 2013 and that same with this other reef here on the right. And what this means is that we might, there might just be a limited amount of resources uh, and sponges and things of that for hawksbills and it's really inhibiting their ability to, to expand as a population. And kind of, I don't know, this is kind of, you know, tossing out uh, some potential ideas is that some of these, you can see in these reefs down here at the bottom, there's a lot more algae and things like that. And this could be actually something that green turtles, maybe they're still able to feel, feed on, but hawksbills are not. So it might be reducing uh, resources for one species and increasing for another. Um, another thing that could be coming into play is that all Hawaiian hawksbill nesting occurs in the main Hawaiian islands. So maybe you guys know what I'm talking about. So the eight main Hawaiian islands where we live and that, but then there's the Northwest Hawaiian islands. So there are these isolated atolls located at about 2000 kilometers to the Northwest of here um, where, and that's where almost all the green turtles nest. So 95% of the nests and majority of nests right here on French frigate shoals. And these are really different habitats, right? Northwest and Hawaiian islands are really isolated. They don't have anthropogenic impacts. They're beautiful, big, sandy beaches uh, where, where the, the honu, the green turtles, aren't disturbed. And so maybe they're able to reproduce more readily in, in these islands, whereas Hawaiian hawksbill nesting is really different. They don't like the big sandy white sand beaches that are kind of typical of many sea turtle species. They like these really dark, small beaches. They're often little coves. They're really, really small. They like lots and lots of vegetation. So if you build a house and you cut down the vegetation, they're not gonna nest there anymore. So they have these, these different uh, requirements for nesting that, that makes it more difficult for them to find appropriate be beaches. So these are, this is actually Kamehame on the Big Island. This is one of the primary hawksbill nesting beaches. It's only 150 meters long, it's really small. And so they'll even dig up each other's nests because it is so small. 
And then you can see some of the some of the nests here that are that have been caged, and I'll talk about that in a second. So again, here's just a graph showing the different beaches and the total number of nests recorded over the last 28 years. You can see Kamehame is by far the most important. The black bars are sites located on the Big Island. The gray ones are those located on Maui, and then this white one is the only one that we know of right now on Molokai. You have a question? Good question. So the, the average is three nests per female, but you can have one nest or you can have up to seven. That's for hawksbills specifically. So it can it vary, but that's why you'll see 14 nests, uh, 14 females in one season, but 49 nests because they're returning and depositing multiple nests. So again, that's just to show the, the differences in the nesting activity at these, these different beaches. Now, at these sites, so on the Big Island where the, the, the Big Island Hawksville project works, uh, and this is uh, Lauren Krapita and Kelly Peebles that run that program, they have a big problem of non-native predators. So mongoose, rats, and feral cats are a big problem. So they actually, they do this where they cage the nests to protect them from these predators, but they actually also uh, actively trap these non-native and and euthanize them. So it's an ongoing important component of the project. Uh, there's also non-native native vegetation. So things like palm trees, even though many of us think that they're native here to Hawaii, they're not. And pepper trees, and they have these really invasive roots that hawksbills haven't evolved to deal with. And so they'll invade the nest, as you can see here, a nest chamber with all the roots in there. And here's a hatchling stuck in the roots. So there are things like that that are a problem. So there are efforts by the project over there to remove non-native vegetation and plant native vegetation. Then we have development. I think I mentioned this, but you know, roads and buildings. And so here, a hawksbill turtle that was seen during the day crossing the road, one back in 96 that got ran over by a car and killed. And so these are, you know, this is late 90s, right after, shortly after those projects were established. And so efforts have been taken. They, you know, put signs up. They put fences. This is next to Kihei in Maui, where which is one of the areas where they nest. And the road is literally right next to the ocean. And so they'll come up, and this is where this one was hit. And so that fence has been erected by Hawaii Wildlife Fund and the partners from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so it's a way to keep them out of out of the road and try to minimize those threats. And then there are natural causes. This is a big volcanic fissure located on the right next to Pohue, one of the main nesting beaches on the Big Island. And you know it's nighttime; the turtles are crawling and they fall in. And uh, so one time they found here's the remains of a turtle that fell in there. And if you're talking about 14 nesting females per year, you lose one female, and it's a huge impact on the population. Uh, on a graph I haven't put in here is that over the co co course of uh, thir almost 30 years, they've only tagged 171 individual hawksbill turtles, so not a lot. And many of those haven't been seen over more than 10 years. They're probably no longer part of the population. So we might be talking about a whole population that might consist of 120 individuals. And so to lose one is, is a big impact. But then, so uh, this one's a live one down here in the left-hand photo, and they did this big operation to rescue it. And so there's efforts right now to see how they can stop turtles from falling into that crack. Easier said than done. Uh, then there's things like erosion, and then with uh, climate change and increased tidal action, this is going to be an increasing problem for for many sea turtle populations. So here you see a nest that was basically washed by the tide. Here was one that exposed, and so in cases where that happens, you have to be very careful to move the nest. You can't change the orientation of the egg. You have to maintain. You put a little marker and you maintain it. You move it really carefully, and if you do that and you don't maintain, if you don't rotate the egg, you'll, you can actually transfer that egg, that nest, and it'll still typically have fairly decent hatch out. So those are some of the things that they're dealing with out in these, pro out in these projects on the Big Island mainly, but also on Maui. Um, now, shifting gears a little bit and talking a little bit about movement in marine turtles. And so I just want to say that, so people have been studying sea turtles for, you know, 40, 50 years now, and there are some really widely accepted broad scale patterns. Like, long distance migration. So hawksbill turtles are known to migrate these really, really long distances, 2,000 kilometers, things like that. Um, and one of the ways you figure that out is by through satellite telemetry. So basically it's a it's a electronic tag that you adhere to the back of a, a turtle and you can do it for marine, for pinnipeds, for like uh, sea lions, uh, monk seals, things like that. And what it does is when that turtle comes to the surface to breathe, it will transmit a signal up to a satellite and then that will get transferred down to the end user. In this case, it's me, but it can be a lot of different people. Um, and, and then what that does is it gives you a, a point of where that turtle was, and then you can basically connect the dots and see where, where the track leads you. So I just got, if I look 
bleary eyed is because I got back this morning from Maui where we just tagged this turtle. So this is the 4th of July. This was yesterday. Mrs. Independence, we called her, or Miss Independence. And, uh, and so we're hoping to learn. Like I said, there's only about one hawksbill nesting on Maui per year. So to get, I went over there two nights and we got it. It was really fortunate. And that was because it had come up 16 days earlier. And following up on the, 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 the fellow's question here about how often they come up is that they were time they, they expect. We think it's going to come up about 16 days, and bam, on the 16th night it came back up, and we were able to get the satellite tag out. So anyway, just a plug on because I just got back and it was really exciting. Um, and so here you're going to see some of the turtles that we've tagged over the last several years. And what you're going to notice by these different tracks is that so you notice most of them were tagged in the south coast of the Big Island, but some of them on southern Maui. What you'll notice is that none of them left the main Hawaiian islands, right? So whereas many populations of sea turtles are tra traveling 2,000 kilometers in Hawaii, the overwhelming majority of the nesting females that were tagged are just staying around Hawaii. So they're a local population. That's not always the case. Here's, oh, well, I don't know why my text there, forgive me for that. Usually, we had this one turtle that we post nester that we tagged and it went way off past Johnston Atoll before the transmitter died out. So they don't all do that, but the overwhelming majority. So this is only happened with one of the 15 or so turtles we've tagged. And so they, they're sticking their, their Hawaii and, and that's really cool. And I'll tell, I, and I'll tell you some of the conservation implications about that in a second. Now shifting gears to still with movements and Marine turtles, but talking about these post hatchlings. So I was telling you earlier that, you know, uh, we know loggerheads off the, the Atlantic coast of the of the U.S. getting these entrenched in these dryers, and they they'll do these. Uh, my, uh, uh, they're they're going to be out in these low ocean ocean gyres for multiple years before then they recruit back to these habitats. Uh, and here in the Pacific, you would expect it to be one of these two two gyres. Um, and then what we know is that females, once they're sexually mature, they'll migrate back to their their uh, natal beaches, so where they are. And this has kind of been the going paradigm that everyone has associated with sea turtles for a long time. And what we found is that uh, this is work, I, again, I did out in the Eastern Pacific, but we think is occurring here is what is known as natal foraging phylopatry. So I used genetics on uh, a bunch of different juvenile turtles that we captured over the years in the Eastern Pacific. And so here's the Eastern Pacific here, and you can see these are all the foraging grounds where we collected samples for. And then there's a nesting colony in each one of these, what I'll call a regional foraging ground. So just consider this box like one big foraging ground, if you will. Uh, and what we found is that the overwhelming majority of the turtles in each of those foraging grounds were contributed from the, the, the rookery, the nesting colony in that same foraging ground. So that's the blue bars here showing that the rookery, so the nesting colony within each one of those regional foraging grounds was contributing the overwhelming majority of the foraging turtles in that same area. And this was the case even for like these regional foraging grounds in close proximity to one another. So here they're only about 100 kilometers uh, distance between these foraging, uh, these, these nesting colonies, but there was very little contribution of this nesting colony to this foraging ground and very little from this nesting colony to this foraging ground. So they're they're sticking local. And what's that telling you is that the Jew, and this was again for juvenile turtles. So what's this telling us is that juveniles are actually remaining in these habitats near their nesting beaches. And it's not just the adults. It's the, the, the juveniles, probably what they're doing is they're going offshore for a little while and then they're recruiting back and they're having this phylopatry. So this affinity or fidelity to these areas much earlier in life than was previously thought. And it's pretty cool stuff. And it again has some conservation implications. Um, and this also is bear in mind that say this, this nesting colony here, here is about two to 300 nests per season. Whereas this one up in Mexico is only like 15. And so you would expect that these larger rookeries would be contributing more animals because they're so much larger to these foraging grounds, but they're not. It's the local rookery, the no local nesting colony that's always providing the majority of the turtles. And so this is this idea of nat natal foraging phylopatry. And so again, it's so this idea of natal phylopatry, it's exhibited across all life stages, not just adults. Uh, this really needs to be integrated into things like general life history for sea turtles and ecological theory. And it provides a lot of sele selective advantages. It makes sense to be close to your nesting beach. If you're close, you don't have to do as long of migration. So you're reducing your threat exposure. Uh, you can do it more frequently it's uh, less resource requirements to go do it so you can do it more often so every year or every other year versus every three or four years uh, and 
the mechanisms for this are still unclear. Is it the currents that are keeping the turtles close? Are they actively returning to these areas? That's not really known. But for for NFP and hawksbills in Hawaii and in the Eastern Pacific in general, what we think is that they just lack this traditional pelagic phase. So they're not going out in these big open ocean gyres. They might go offshore, but they're sticking around Hawaii. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And that's called this type one hatchling development pattern that was really only thought to be ap applicable to flatbacks, which is a, a species endemic to Australia. So we think here in the Eastern and Central Pacific, this is what's happening with hawksbill turtles. And in Ecuador, so some of the work we did before we came out here is that we had these one-year-old uh, hawksbills that we put the smaller satellite tag on and we released them offshore to see what they did. And they didn't go out in these open ocean gyres. They did spend some time offshore, but they're only about 20 kilometers offshore and they didn't, these, tra these tags only last, last about three months and then they fall off. So, but you can see that they didn't go very far from land. So this kind of supports this theory that they're sticking locally and this is a publication by uh, kyle van hooten in 2016 where he did some drifter uh modeling so you basically a, dr a drifter is a satellite tag that you place in the water and you let the currents take it and what he found is for the the ones that the orange ones is what he was modeling for hawksville turtles is that the drifters they you know here's at 3.5 months here's at 6.6 .6 months and here's at 13 so they were going fair distances this is actually almost 2,000 kilometers so they they were drifting but they weren't doing again this open ocean gyre thing so here they are at a year and a half and they're still not um they're still not very very far and again this is a drifter so hot, sea turtles will, will actively swim so they could get a current taking this out there and they could swim back if they wanted to this is so what we're hoping to do in the future is do some of that research with the sat tags on say a ton 10 month reared uh hawksbill and and releasing them offshore and seeing what they do and if they actually go out in these go out far like this or if they try to remain near hawaiian water so that's part of the research that we're we're getting into right now and now that i'm here that's a big part of the thing that i'm doing is really trying to ramp up the the hawksbill research and i i want you know we have had the strandings or observations of three hawksbills here around hawaii that are about as big as your hand. So that's your lost years. So the fact that we're finding these individuals near the main Hawaiian islands is an indication that maybe our theory is correct, that they're sticking around and, uh, and maybe they get, you know, a big tide or a, a big current or uh, the trade winds might blow them ashore. But there's evidence that they're sticking around the, the Hawaiian islands. And so what does this tell us? Well, so hawksbills are local to Hawaii. They, they don't migrate. They don't have a lot of, they don't appear to have a lot of connectivity with other ocean regions. Uh, the nesting females haven't been ever been seen on other beaches, beaches in other areas. And in fact, you'll, we've never seen a, a nesting hawksbill in Maui over on, on the big island and vice versa. Uh, so they're very, they're very local. And this means that if we're protecting hawksbills in the foraging grounds, we're really protecting them at the at our local nesting grounds as well. This is a lot different than if you're dealing with a species that migrates across multiple ocean regions. So I could be protecting them in Nicaragua and protecting them, make sure they hatch, and then they go to Ecuador and someone eats them, right? So this is from a from a local stewardship perspective. It's it's a really big benefit because we go. These are our local turtles. If we protect them at the beaches, we know we're helping repopulate our waters as well. And from a government and a legislative. Uh, perspective. It's easier because you're not having to deal with multi governments of multiple nations. And so it makes it easier from a management perspective. And we can protect both uh, the majority of both the life cycle. So from when they're very, very young until they're adults and the whole stock. So the whole Hawaiian population. But the reverse is also true, right? If we don't take care of them, they're not going to get repopulated from other ocean regions. So we have the potential to also, uh, I don't want to say destroy the population, but if we're not careful, that can be a negative thing as well. Um, another thing we do is in-water monitoring. And so we do, you know, we, we try to do hand captures. Th this isn't how it often works. Usually they just stay out of reach. And so this is, this is a capture of a very small juvenile hawksbill. I know you guys in here in Hawaii, if you snorkel a lot, you know that you have these really docile turtles in most other regions that's not how it is and hawksbills are not they're not like the green turtles that they just swim by and they kind of look you see a hawksbill though usually they take off i'm showing you footage of uh one individual in particular that didn't take off but you know our capture rate during the day is probably about 15 20 percent so it's really hard but we do do it at night so at night i don't have i have there's a little bit clip of that at the very end of the talk but uh is that the turtles will they'll just go to sleep. And so you can go with a nightlight and you can basically find them hidden in the caves and you can just pull them up. And, and then what we do is uh, we, we put these, 
what's called a flipper tag. So this is an Inconel tag. So uh, it has a code on it that if, if we recapture them or they come up nesting, we can know where we originally tagged them. So we can see things like movement. If they're feeding on Oahu and then they go to to, to nest on the big island. Uh, we also do satellite telemetry of juveniles to try to understand like habitat use and how long they remain in certain habitats. And then we do things if you're able to recapture the individual, you can see things like growth rates, how long, that's how we know how long they take to reach certain age and reproductive status. But we can also look at things like survival rates and, and things of that nature. Um, and I, so some of the in-water threats and, and we, we have stranding. So this is a stranding network that's been, we've run out of NOAA for about, uh, I don't know exactly, about 20 years, I believe. Uh, but it's a number that if you find a sick or dead turtle anywhere around any of the main Hawaiian islands, you can call and we can, we'll can we have it shipped uh, and, and we'll do some sample collection and, and analysis. And what you're seeing here is strandings of hawksbills uh, over the course of the past 30 years around the main Hawaiian islands. Now, if you see, saw this map with green turtles, it's chock -a block full, right? So it, this is over the course of 30 years, and we've had 90. This is a total of 90 strandings. Nice round number makes it easy, but but you know, green turtles in that same time frame is you know more than five times that. But what we can see is that we have strandings all around, and what we found is that we do aside from collecting samples, we also check a box on anything that we see might be affiliated with that death. We have things like, are they emaciated? Uh, do we see signs of like shark predation? Signs we've got a turtle that has half its shell ripped open by a shark. Um, and some of these other things, and what you'll notice at the very top here is fishing gear. So the the, the majority of turtles that we're actually encountering are, are being found with either hooks or with lines or nets. And you can actually, if you look at those different things, we can see that hook and line fisheries are the predominant things that we're finding. And so we're getting turtles with hooks in their mouths uh, or ingested, and that's actually the problem. So you can have a turtle that will actually have a hook in its mouth or in its throat, but over time that that hook will corrode away. But the line, the fishing line, gets down into the into the the the, the gut, the uh, uh, intestinal tract, and it'll wrap, it'll make the the intestines wrap up real tight, and then they just die because they're they're not able to process their food. So. And the indication that most of the uh, uh, ones that are fishing are from here. They're all actually the overwhelming majority, and that's is near shore fisheries, right? So it's people fishing from the shore, and I'm not, I'm, I like to fish as well, right? So it's not about trying to stop this; it's just making people aware of, say, if you do catch a turtle, pull, pull it in and cut that line as close as you can to the hook and let it go, right? Uh, obviously, if you have a trap, this is a, a lobster trap. This is very; it's only happened like twice, but it, it can happen. It's it's an impressive photo, so I put it in there just for people to take a look at. But um, so it doesn't affect this species because hawksbills are very coastal, right? They stay very, very close to shore. That's where all the reefs are. Now, if you're talking about loggerhead turtles or leatherback turtles, which are found more offshore, that's a whole different fishery. I'm only talking about hawksbill turtles here. So, good questions, though. Could the emaciation be a secondary effect? Absolutely. And then the problem is that we don't know. So we kind of write down what we can. But, you know, uh, if you look at the same data for like green turtles, they have fibropapillomas, which are, it's, a, it's this herpes virus that you'll see tumors all over. Hawksbills don't get that. But if you have all kinds of uh, tumors or maybe internal ones that you can't see, you're going to be emaciated because maybe you can't eat properly and things like that. So a lot of these might be correlated and, and overlap, right? So. Um, I had a little, it's not all bad news. So we get a lot of strandings and then we are, we're able, we have facilities where we can rehab turtles and then we release them. So this was actually just yesterday as well. Lo and behold, we got two hawksbills, one on the nesting beach and one in the water. And it was really small individual, almost those lost year size, but not quite. And then we were able to release it. This was released in Pearl Harbor where uh, there's not a lot of fishing effort. So it was a good play. And turtles actually really like Pearl Harbor. Um, some genetics things as well. I'm not going to go into this too much because I know the second I say genetics, people's eyes start to gloss over. Um, the only thing I really want to talk about is that we found some unique, so we found some haplotypes, so some genetic lineages, if you will, that are found throughout the Pacific. And we even found, so my work in the Eastern Pacific, we found this, this gray haplotype. We thought it was only exclusive to the Eastern Pacific, but now we find it, it's actually really common here in Hawaii. And also these other, this, this, this one is called EIIP33, and that's found 
throughout the Pacific. And what this possibly tells us is that Hawaii has served as a stepping stone uh, on evolutionary time frame for hawksbills to to po populate the eastern Pacific. So they basically bounced over along along Hawaii and potentially along the uh, Galapagos in the southern hemisphere to kind of populate the eastern Pacific. But what this also tells us is that there's uh, a couple of unique haplotypes here to Hawaii, and this tells us that it really needs to be managed as a distinct management unit. So it has this these you know this high value uh, genetic uh, uh, distinct distinctiveness that we need to conserve as as conservationists and 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 managers. And what we'll, we'll see. So here's that same graph here looking at nesting. And what you can see is that the haplotype. So these lineages in the foraging grounds is really really different. And you'll notice that this one haplotype that is present in the nesting uh, individuals isn't in all the foraging samples we've collected. We don't see it at all. And so this is really interesting because potentially it means that we're not getting to the, there might be foraging grounds out there that we have yet to identify and sample from. And vice versa is that we're actually seeing haplotypes that are much more frequent in the foraging grounds that aren't in the nesting grounds. And what that tells us is that there's probably nesting grounds around the Hawaiian Islands that we still have yet to identify. And we even have this one EIIP03 that was only found in the foraging ground. We have yet to identify it in, in a nesting ground. So that, again, tells us that there's nesting sites out there. And so one of the things we're really trying to do right now is to beef up our 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 efforts to identify potential nesting and get a better idea of how many hawksbills are actually inhabiting the Hawaiian Islands by doing these isolated beaches. So that's the challenge with hawksbill turtles. I was telling you the kind of beaches that they utilize is that they're often really isolated. They're really hard to get to. And when you only have a few nests per season, it's really easy to miss them, right? So what we're trying to do now and what we're going to be doing over the next few years is focusing our efforts in some of these beaches, these hidden beaches, and doing it in the peak season. So here we can see right now, July, August, September, that's when the nesting peaks. And so we're going to try to focus these efforts during these times in these beaches. And we're doing things like using drones. So uh, some of these beaches that are really, you can't access them by vehicle or by foot, is that we're going to be flying over these beaches. And you can see here's some basking turtles, but you can see their tracks. I don't know if you can see that really well, but you can. And so it's feasible to say, go in a boat, go off the shore, fly your drone over in the early morning and try to record the tracks of hawksbill turtles. This is one of many. We're still doing like the traditional foot patrols where you can walk to the beaches during the peak and try to find these tracks uh, uh, on your own. But you know, the, the problem with using drones and doing this technique is that, is that, again, we're back to this habitat. So if you're crawling all over big rocks, I'm not gonna see, we're not gonna see the track, right? Uh, if they're doing it on the sandy areas, uh, we will be able to see it, but a lot of times they're, they're crawling over these rocks and into the vegetation, and this just makes it extra challenging. And, and it may be part of the reason why we just have not been able to learn a lot about the species is because they're really cryptic and really hard to find. Um, and some of the indications goes back to hatchlings too. So this is strandings, but now looking strictly at hatchlings, so little baby turtles. And what you'll notice is that we've had quite a bit, we've had a few, you know, strandings here and there, but along the eastern coast of Oahu, we've actually had a, a really large number of, of hawksbill, uh, hatchling strandings, and we've never had a confirmed nest over here. And so there's, I think there's either one or two things that are happening. One is that there's nests happening and people just don't see it because you go out there, it's under the vegetation, the tide washes away the track, and people aren't reporting it. So we don't really know. So there's potential there could be nesting in Kailua and Waimanalo and that area and up here closer to the North Shore. Or it could be that these are actually from the big island and they're getting blown over right after they hatch by the trade winds and they're getting washed up on the east coast of Oahu. So it's one of those two things is probably what's happening. Uh, and just kind of some other good news is that just this season, I, I went over to Molokai and there's this beach called Halava that has been, you know, been rumored to host hawks nesting hawksbills for many years. I had colleagues of mine have gone over there sporadically to go check it out and they found evidence. And so I was just able to rally a bunch of local folks to actually start visiting the site. Uh, we're trying to shoot for every day during the peak of the season just to record any nesting activity and they've already had five nests. So again, it's just once you put the effort into it, maybe it'll happen, right? So um, we're just getting started with the nesting season. There could be 20 nests there, really exciting stuff. We're really hopeful and we'll get, I guess we'll just see what happens. And if we do find uh, undiscovered sites, this is going to give us new 
and additional conservation opportunities. So we, hopefully we can set up projects, it, look if there's predation going on, reduce predation. And then what we want in the end is to try to increase the overall population size, right? Um, and this could eventually we could see additional management units. Right now we're considering it looks like all of Hawaiian hawks are one management unit, but we really the overwhelming majority of our samples come from one like the Big Island, right? So it, potentially, if we find additional sites and we do more genetics, we might be able to actually identify that there's different nesting sites that have different genetic signatures. And what that also might mean is that there are a, there might be additional nesting females out there, which well, that would be good. It'll bode well for the future of the population. And we might need to do some updated assessments. But even if we were to do that, even if we were to double the number, it still would be tiny, 15. So let's say we went from 14 nesting females to 30. You know, that's nothing. That's may, This is possibly the most endangered sea turtle population on the planet. And that is interesting. It's it, from, a, I don't know, for me personally, the high threat scenario is, is fascinating from a research perspective and hopefully from people's interests as well. Uh, about a meter. So, and that's actually Ingrid and Joaquin in the background. That's actually uh, when he was here. He, he, uh, Joaquin's been involved with Citro work since he was in my wife's tummy. So, um, so this is a brochure we just finished last week. We're really trying to increase information. So we're gonna. I. Don't hold this against me. I didn't actually bring any today. I forgot. But um, we're going to be handing these out. We're sticking them at dive shops. We're getting, we really want people to report hawksbills. So if you're snorkeling and you see them or you find a nest, and you know, even if you don't know it's a hawk, if it's a hawksbill, let us know and we'll go and check it out, right? Because like I said, the, over, the majority of nests here around the main Hawaiian Islands are actually hawksbill nests. So if you do find one, it's, it's possible it's a hawksbill. Um, so that's one of the things we're doing. And then uh, we're all, you know, trying to raise awareness. We try to get people involved in these activities, and uh, you know, the the youth uh, over on the Big Island. And this was a turtle that was rescued by George Balaz and Lauren out of a uh, had gotten knocked into one of the the fish ponds, and so they released it. And just getting people involved, putting up signs, people lo know when there's nesting habitats, and just really trying to spread the word. And um, and then I'm just going to jump over. So I'm going to show you this a uh, four minute video. This is basically, the, and th this is by everything. Thing that I just spoke about to you in the last whatever, however long, sorry we talk a lot, is going to be summed up in four minutes. But it's just some cool footage, so I wanted to I wanted to share it with you. So I think I can just jump over here. Uh, it should have sound. I don't know. Yes, there's narration, so that'd be great. Okay. This video was also we just did this, so it's part of the effort to really bring the profile. Of the species. Can we hear anything? You let me know when. I pause it to hear one. In the near shore waters of the island of Hawaii, scientist Alexander Gauss carries out a night capture of a hawksbill sea turtle. are measured, weighed, and flipper tag, part of the research underway to better understand and manage the Hawaiian colony of Hawksville sea turtles. One important aspect of our research is conducting interwater monitoring at, at foraging sites, so where turtles feed. If we're lucky enough to find the same turtles again, over time what we can do is we can understand things like how much do turtles grow over a certain period of time? How long do they actually remain in a particular habitat? And this information then tells us are the appropriate management strategies that we should take to ensure viability of the species into the future. Global populations have declined by an estimated 90% over the last 100 years, having a major impact on the ability of hawksbills to fulfill their ecological roles. As they're the only species of sea turtles that eat sponges, they help ensure sponges don't overtake the reef. The main Hawaiian islands host the largest and only consistent nesting colony in the U.S. Pacific, but still only receive about 14 nesting females each year. The need to focus research on this population is critical. Satellite devices are attached to track turtle movement. When the turtle comes to the surface to breathe, the transmitter sends a signal to orbiting satellites, and this sends a location point down to the scientists who can then connect the dots and get a track of the turtle's movements. We've tagged a total of 16 adult female hawksbill turtles. Results from satellite telemetry have shown us that after nesting, 
the adult female hawksbills that they might migrate from one island to the other or remain on the same island, but they almost never leave the island chain of, of Hawaii. And this really contrasts sharply with some of the migratory behavior exhibited by the species in other parts of the world and, and really presents us with some unique conservation and management opportunities so we can protect the entire life cycle and both foraging and nesting sites for the species. We're also trying to learn about the genetics of hawksbill turtles around the Hawaiian Islands. We take a skin sample for genetic analysis, which can give us insights into things like which nesting colonies are contributing the most to the different foraging grounds. Uh, how long have the different nesting colonies been separated and how different genetically are they? And we can even gain insights into things like how many males are in the population. Using a genetic database, NOAA scientists are able to identify hawksbills that don't originate from any of the known beaches in Hawaii, providing clues that there are nesting sites that are unaccounted for. So there are a number of beaches around the Hawaiian Islands that simply haven't been investigated today because they're isolated or really hard to get to in both. We're looking to implement innovative tools such as drones, so drones can access the areas much more easily in a fraction of the time. Until we inventory these beaches, we can know the importance for the population. How many hospitals do they support? What threats exist? These are the types of things that once we know, then we can get a better assessment of the Hawaiian hospital population. Fortunately, there are several organizations here on Hawaii that have been protecting nests and ensuring hatchlings make it to the sea safely for decades. And this really gives us optimism and hope that the population will rebound in the near future. Hawksbill nests are often destroyed by non-native predators such as mongoose, rats, and feral cats. Conservation efforts to protect nests and hatchlings are essential and are carried out by many partners. These groups also generate important information that we incorporate into our scientific research. By combining all of these research tools, we can really get a better assessment of hawksbill turtle populations around the Hawaiian Islands. And what we ultimately want is there to be healthy, robust populations of hawksbills inhabiting Hawaiian waters and allowing them to fulfill their ecological roles. So there, everything I said in four minutes. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that, that's really all I got. I um, I also want to say, you know, it's, I think it's great. I think that the fact for the last 34 years that research has, research has been focused on green turtles and protecting them and learning about them, and I don't want to detract from that at all. I just want to throw hawksbills in the spotlight as well and start to generate more attention for the species uh, because aside from the, you know, the project on the Big Island, they've kind of been out there doing it on their own and a little bit on Maui. And I really want to put a push and make an emphasis to try to learn more about them and understand maybe why they're not rebounding and what do we need to do to make make that that happen. So I don't, I'm open to questions if people have them. That's that's what I have for you tonight. I knew someone was going to ask me that question. Um, so the the it has an there, there was no nesting in Kapoho Bay, and there it's so if you think about the the main Hawaiian island chain, there's foraging ground all all around the chain. Uh, so really, from a foraging perspective, it's that's only one little area, and so turtles obviously have the ability to move and not remain where hot lava is falling into the water. But it hasn't destroyed any nesting beaches. Yeah. Um, there's one particular nesting site on the Big Island where every year no one used to call for volunteers to go out and protect them at night from being run over by cars. Uh -huh. So you have a lot of people out there, and I assume they did a lot of data collecting out there on that particular beach. And does did you actually get a lot of data out there or not? So the place where they were run over is on Kihei and on Maui and that they got data, but you're talking about one, if you're lucky, two turtles a season, right? So when we talk about a lot of data, you got to put it in perspective. Well, so it was a big island, but I, there's no reports of a turtle ever being run over on the big island. But the, all, I mean, the majority of the data you're looking at and like the trend, this, the majority of that is from the big island, right? So that's exactly where that came from. 
So they, you know, they, there's overlap. So you'll see them together oftentimes, but they have distinct niches. They have, they feed on different things. So green turtles eat algae and, 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 and seagrass, whereas hawksbills eat sponges and tunicates and things like that. So there's niche division, but you'll often find them in the same habitats. But because I mean, you, on Hanama Bay, you see green turtles all the time. I think they've seen one hawksbill. I thought actually there'd be a, more hawksbills here than, than they've seen, but uh, they, a lot of people don't know the difference as well. It's hard. It's hard to tell if you're not if you're not dealing with them every day. So yeah, they're overlap, and I don't know how they're competing directly. But there's niche division. Sure, there's chart where there's some activity around the climbing Uh huh. Yeah, that stranding. Yeah. Yeah, I mean when. It typically doesn't happen when the turtles are really big, but it still does happen. They'll take a chunk out of them. Um, but they're definitely, if that's a big sharky area, which I didn't realize it was. Well, I guess all of Hawaii is quite sharky. Um, <laughs> only in the water. Yeah, only in the water. That's good. Only in the water. But, I mean, I'm sure they're, yeah, I mean, if I was a shark, I'd be eating little turtles. Sure. Is that? <laughs> oh, yeah, like avoiding them. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's why they're stranding, you know. Trying to get away. Um, yeah, you know, I, I maybe I, when they're that small, they, I, don't, I, I think they're, you know, they're getting carried by the winds and the currents, and they're trying to swim, but they're, they're probably at the whim of the currents and tides more than anything at that point. So, any other questions? I may have missed something. The Hawksbill turtle population has been fairly level for quite a long time. You actually have solid information that there used to be a much higher population, or are they always been small? That's a, actually a really good question. It's something that it's not super clear. So all the anecdotal information we get is that, like, so stories and fishermen and people, and same for the Eastern Pacific, because it's hard to have those historical records, is that it's always been less rare, way less rare than the green turtles. So, and that's the same in the Eastern Pacific. But we do have evidence and, and, uh, and, and like harvest records, actually, some from from the Eastern Pacific, not so much from here, from Hawaii, that there was quite a bit of tortoise shell collection. And most of that was like exported to Japan. So this is like 100 years ago. Um, but we don't have any like solid concrete evidence that they were they were they were ever really, really large. It's one of the big mysteries. And I, I actually saw so we're writing a lot of this up for a, a nesting ecology manuscript, an article right now. And that's one of the things I talk about in there. It's like. So we're not even clear like we think it probably is a decline from historical numbers but how much and how severe that decline has been we don't know but the interesting thing is that we know it was for green turtles and we see them rebounding now that they've been protected whereas we're not seeing that with hawksbill turtles so it's, it's just interesting um and you know one of the things i also didn't show i, I didn't put a graph in here was that it, but it's a really interesting aspect is that so in the beginning when we when they first started monitoring at these sites they started tagging the turtles and so after a while, the idea is that you're going to saturate tag, you're going to do saturation tagging. So all the females are going to be tagged, right? And so at that at a certain point, every turtle that you get back each year is going to be like a turtle you already know, um, unless it's a new recruit to the population. And interestingly enough, that in the very beginning that happened, like the what's called a neophyte turtle, so the first time tur turtle that was ever observed, and the beginning was obviously really high because they were just seeing them, but then they started tagging them. And so at the very beginning, there were less and less of new turtles and more and more of the old turtles. But then over the last 10 years, we're actually seeing about 50% of the turtles every year are new turtles. And so it brings up two questions is like, what's happening to all the old turtles? Are they dying? Are they using other beaches? Where are they going? But it's also kind of bodes well for, for the future of the population because it shows us that there are new turtles still coming in the population. And so that, that's a good sign as well. And maybe if we inventory these other beaches, we'll see that they're actually starting to use other sites. So it's all part of the research. Hopefully, we can figure out. I mean, well, I don't know about that far back, but like if we're talking about official legislation, they were they were both in the early seventies. So with the creation of the Major Species Act and mid mid seventies, and when the different species were added in there, so they've basically been protected for the same amount of time. But now, uh, you know, the efforts to shut down the the commercial trade of tortoiseshell and things like that, 
happened all there you know it was a global effort it wasn't just in hawaii or anything like that so that that's been around for a while is there a viability? oh go ahead is there a viability of having tracking devices being longer on the right so right now you know so there's two things that happen so you put a satellite tag on and you're, you're dealing with two different things one is that either the tenant gets knocked off or the i mean the tenant gets sheared off gets cut off because they're going under rocky coral ledges or the whole antenna just gets knocked, uh, the whole set tag gets knocked off. Um, but the other issue is battery, right? So how do you get a device that the battery stays working for so long? And, um, you know, technology has improved. If you, it, what they have is called a saltwater switch so that now it's only when the turtle comes to the surface, the conductivity between these sensors changes and that tells the tag to start transmitting so that it will only transmit when the turtle's at the surface and it won't be wasting battery when it's under the water. But still, typically, more than the battery life, the issue is the tag getting knocked off, especially with hawksbill turtles, because they they love these coral reefs, and they love to, they wedge themselves. And if you see some of the footage, yeah, there's a guy named Don McLeish that has some really good footage from here, the Hawaiian Islands, and they just like go and they rub their shells on the reef. And that's, green turtles don't do that. It's only hawksbills that do that. So it makes it difficult. And we, typically, we get about, the average uh, lifespan for a tag is about three months. But then we've had some go for almost two years. So, uh, yeah, the question. So, I have two questions actually. One is about this how stable do you feel this support and funding is for the work that you So, when I. Where's your funding coming from? So, our funding is. So, what I want to say is like, I want to give a plug more to the Hawksville Conservation Programs because that's like Lauren, especially on the Big Island, is that they're they're uh they're part of it's it's, a, it's an interesting uh situation where they get some funding from hawaii volcanoes national park but then they also get funding from noaa from us so we fund some of their, from the regional office not not we're on the science center so we're the science side of things uh you know we're we're part of the i work for part of, i'm part of the government right so we have funding for that but we don't have we i don't do the nest conservation I do the research side of things. We do the things like when people ask us, like, what's the population and what's happening to green turtles and loggerheads and should we shut down fisheries? And those are the things that we're involved with. Um, now, those projects, though, and it's semi-stable. So they usually get grants for like four-year time periods. So I, we came from an NGO background. So for me, it was like year every year I was trying to find money to live on and to have these projects that we're doing down in Nicaragua and El Salvador. And they have it a little bit more stable, but they have like if they don't get funded one cycle, they're done. I mean, they don't have that money. It's going to be really difficult. And in fact, one of the issues is, is that so because these sites are really hard to get to, they have big volunteer teams and they have to they bring in like biologists, volunteers that come and do internships for three or four months and they have to give them food. Like they don't even, they give them a tiny stipend, like a hundred bucks a month or something. But you're basically working. I mean, that's how I started. Everyone works for free in the beginning if you're working with sea turtles uh, because it's cool work and it's fun. But they have to have a house they have to rent a house for them and so if they don't have funding like some years they've had to only do certain beaches because they don't have enough people or funding to cover enough people to do all the beaches and so part of the issue with that data and because we and why we don't want to do trend analysis is because it hasn't been consistent enough so some beaches one year and then the next year they don't do it and then there's these other beaches we're not aware of of what's happening and so we don't have that data yet but it's never super stable, as, as stable as we want it. But I mean, that goes, I'm, my job isn't super stable either. So it's like, yeah. So my second yeah. question was about you. I guess you have a PhD. Yeah. Um, what's your, so where did you start when you graduated high school in terms of the degree you got? So I, right after I graduated high school, I was, so I grew up like in Baja in Mexico, like spirit, like a spirit fit. I lived on the beach with my, my dad's a, Spanish and he's a little bit of a gypsy and he just took us all over the place with him. I have two sisters and my mom uh, and my mom's Argentinian. So I speak fluent Spanish. So for me, Latin America was the natural place to start all of this. And so when I, gra I, you know, I graduated high school, I was, I was going to, I wanted to go like work and make some money. And my dad's, Hey, you know, you should go to college, um, get a degree. Cause it's way harder to leave college and, and go back than it is to go to college and then get a job. You know what I mean? Like to do. So he convinced me to go to college and there I, I'm sorry if I'm taking a lot of time, but we're still good. Uh, uh, you know, I did, you know, I did, I, I start out like outdoor leadership, taking people on backpacking stuff. And then I did uh, wetland monitoring and I did marine mammals. And then I went down on an internship in Costa Rica and like did turtle work, met my wife, fell in love with sea turtles and with her. And, uh, and, and so then I came back and, or when we were there, we actually, we, 
we started doing work with sea turtles. So I got, a, you know, I did, I worked hard. We worked volunteers in Galapagos and Costa Rica. Uh, and then after a couple of years of basically volunteering, so it was like traveling for free. So you, you travel, you go, they give you room and board. You're not wasting any money and you're doing cool stuff. It pads your career, your, your resume. And then, and I got, a, you know, I got a little job and, and took advantage of it and made some stuff happen. And then after like working in the real world there for about seven years, I said, you know what, I want, I, I need to like a, a little bit more of the theoretical foundations and the academic side of things. Like I was really good in the field and working with fishermen and creating these projects, but I wanted more of the th theoretical and the academic and learning a little bit more in depth about it. So I went back and did a master's at, at, in San Diego and that was all we were still doing the Hawksville thing and it was all based on satellite telemetry. And then when I was, I, and I, my plan was just to go back to master's like so people would not only for the theoretical foundation, but so people will listen to you more. Like it gives you more credit, right? And you're trying to uh, influence people and your vision and, and put your your vision into, into management plans and that kinds of things and you carry a little more weight when you have a degree. So I went back, just did a master's and then our whole work in the Eastern Pacific really started snowballing. I never thought I was gonna do genetics, never. I mean, I'm not a genetic guy, but then I, I was doing the satellite telemetry and all these, I, we networked with all these people and they started finding spots and we started helping them establish projects. And we started collecting samples. And so the natural kind of next thing was do genetics. And there was a guy that I worked with in San Diego, like Jeff Seminoff supported me on my telemetry stuff. And then another guy, Peter Dutton, who's a geneticist said, Hey, you should come and do your PhD with me. So after I finished my master's, I went to the PhD. It was just like, it was the natural thing, you know, but I was still doing our, our, our NGO work. So I still had that fix. I wasn't just strictly a student. You know what I mean? There's a lot of ways to make it through, through academic, uh, through grad school, you know, and if there's someone or someone's interested in learning more, I'm happy to share that information. I got business cards I can give you or whatever. So your undergraduate degree was what? Environmental studies. So undergrad environmental studies, your master's degree was in biology. And then my PhD was in ecology.